You look just like her. I look nothing like her. You didn't even see her. I <gasps> heard her. Yeah, well, that's the same thing. Welcome to the Graveyard Slot, where we talk about movies past their prime time. Here, we revisit old favorites with a fresh perspective to see if they deserve more hype or if they should stay buried. I'm Sarah. And I'm Sohini. And today, we're talking about Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is a 2011 movie about Grace, Emma, and Meg who go on a trip to Paris, where Grace is mistaken for British heiress Cordelia, who looks just like her. After a series of misunderstandings and mishaps, they end up in Monte Carlo, where each gets roped into a different adventure that leads them to learn more about themselves and each other. The movie was directed by Thomas Bazooka, who has also been involved in movies like The Family Stone and the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. He was also involved in writing the screenplay along with Maria Magenti and April Blair, who has written for the movie Lemonade Mouth and the 2021 version of Gossip Girl. What does this repertoire mean for you? I mainly was interested in April Blair's filmography because I was unsurprised to see Lemonade Mouth and Gossip Girl on it because the vibe is quite similar, like especially Lemonade Mouth aimed at a younger demographic yeah. and perhaps less emphasis on the substance. <laughs> see, my opinions on Lemonade Mouth is pretty positive, so... But the 2021 Gossip Girl explains it a lot. It's like, so when you mentioned it, I was like, Lemonade Mouse. Oh, 2021 Gossip Girl. Oh. <laughs> so like, you put those two things together and you get Monte Carlo. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting combination. Anyway, we wanted to talk about this movie because we remember it being a fun romp. And we're delighted that it has a low enough rating on Rotten Tomatoes to warrant a closer <laughs> look on the graveyard slot. But also, to be completely honest... We were gonna do New York Minute <laughs> and found it so unwatchable, we jumped ship and landed on this movie. <laughs> Complete transparency here on the podcast. I don't know that we ended up on a much better <laughs> ship, to be completely honest. <laughs> anyway, back to Monte Carlo, <laughs> the movie we're actually planning on talking about this episode. I don't really have any remarkable memories of this movie, just that I was in the target demographic when I first watched it, in my preteens or in my teen years, and I enjoyed it a lot. It was a fun movie. I really liked it, so I was surprised this time around that my feelings were so negative. <laughs> but yeah, at this point, I cannot possibly pinpoint what I liked so much about it at the time, but the movie did its job, I suppose, because as a younger audience member. I did enjoy it. How was your experience with this movie? I was definitely in the target audience as well. I actually remember anticipating this movie. Like, I remember watching the trailer and being like, oh, that's coming up. I should keep an eye out. And I watched it when it came out or like pretty close to when it came out and enjoyed it, you know, well enough. I think I just thought it was a fun romp. And honestly, I still do. Overall, I think it's like, okay, it's as advertised, you know? <laughs> Is it? I don't know. Because like you said, it's supposed to be a fun romp. But what I found was getting in the way of that this time around is the story <laughs> because it was so anxiety inducing to me. <laughs> and actually, I am not alone in the sentiment because I found a review from... AV Club that says the biggest of many problems with Monte Carlo is that the fantasy cannot possibly be enjoyed for a second because the deception looms so large. And this captures perfectly what I was feeling the entire time I was watching this movie. I think I misremembered it in that I thought the characters, including Cordelia, were going to be in on the plot <laughs> together. But when I realized that the whole movie is basically a string of crimes, <laughs> against Cordelia, it just took away the enjoyment for me. Because the whole time I was thinking, there's going to be such horrible consequences for what they're doing. But of course, because this is an alternate universe where nothing bad can possibly happen to the main characters, they get away with it. And not even in a close to realistic way. It just all comes together magically. And it's worse than having a fairy godmother, bippity boppity boo, everything back together. <laughs> to me, it doesn't really deliver on what it promises because the storyline is not fun for me <laughs> and neither is the story satisfying, neither are the characters particularly remarkable and the whole thing is just somehow it's bland and rage-inducing at the same time. 
Do you feel that way more about this movie or Letters to Juliet? Because that's exactly how I feel about Letters to Juliet. It wasn't as rage-inducing for me because even though it was bland and the message wasn't great, at least they weren't criminals. (laughs) (laughs) They were criminals of love and filmmaking. (laughs) It's supposed to be a romantic comedy and dull as it is, it's still a romantic comedy. But with this movie, I feel like it's advertised as, well, adventure, coming of age, comedy, whatever. But it's more like a crime film. (laughs) Let me just say, watching the realization dawn on you bit by bit over time as we watch this movie. (laughs) I was as unsuspecting as Cordelia was, and we both paid the price. (laughs) Yeah. The reviews I found, I agree with. There's one from the Philadelphia Inquirer that reads, The actresses are appealing, the settings photogenic, and the clothes ideal for a triple Cinderella fantasy. It's not art, but it is entertaining. And that's like the most you can say about this movie. It captures the thing that I discovered this time around, actually holds the movie together for me, which is the performance. I was really surprised at how much more forgiving I am of it because of some of the performance. Yes, you're right. It wouldn't be fair to discredit the main cast's performance. No, I think like Letters to Juliet, I really like Emma Seyfried as an actor, and I don't think she did a bad job or anything in that movie, but it didn't make me like the movie. Mm -hmm. I still remember it every step of the way. I fucking hate this movie. (laughs) And in this one, there was something about Liam Neeser's acting that made me forgive everything. I agree with you. That's what I was saying, because I am obviously being quite harsh on this movie, but... Despite my negative views on it, I also do want to acknowledge that the actors, especially Leighton Meester, do a really good job. And while that does not make me like the movie any better, I still want to acknowledge (laughs) that she did add something positive to the movie. There's another review, though, that's a little on the more negative side from Chicago Sun-Times. It reads, It's chirpy, it's bright, there are pretty locations, and lots happens. This is the kind of movie that can briefly hold the attention of a cat. I just thought (laughs) it was really funny, so I had to include it. But again, I think that's what it is. It's like pretty on the surface, and then it like kind of falls apart if you look at it um, for too long. Yeah, I can agree with that. It is a very aesthetically pleasing movie. It's got the sights of Paris and Monte Carlo, so it couldn't really fall flat on that front. But that's all it is. Although I will say, not to rag on Letters to Juliet again, (laughs) this movie kind of treats Paris the same way that Letters to Juliet treated Verona. It's very like romanticized Mm -hmm. and whatever. The only thing I could distinguish potentially is that Letters to Juliet romanticized Italy, not necessarily the characters, but the movie itself, like the filmmakers romanticized Italy. Whereas here, it's not the filmmakers, it's the characters. And the writers are aware of this because they even have Grace's mother call her out a little, Yeah, where she says, going to Paris is not going to change you as a person. I just wish they had explored this theme further because Grace throughout (laughs) has got this idea in her head about what this trip is going to be like. And... She never comes back to reality. Never! And I thought that was the fucking point. But that's not her arc at all. The point was for her to get a boyfriend. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, let's get into it. We've talked about three movies at this point. Letters to Juliet, New York Minute. (laughs) We've talked more about Letters to Juliet than we have about this actual movie. So yeah, let's just get straight into it. We'll be discussing this movie chronologically as usual. And we start off in Texas. (laughs) Grace graduates high school and is gearing up for her trip to Paris with Emma, her friend from work. However, her plans are spoiled when her mom and stepdad make them take her stepsister Meg along on the trip. Grace's introduction in the diner where she works. She's given a plate of food for a table, but I think she rearranges it to look like a smiley face. (laughs) And I quite like that actually, because... It gave me the impression that Grace is optimistic and someone who makes the best out of a given situation. And that's also similar to what we see of her throughout the movie, because even when they end up in less than ideal situations, she tries her best to make the best of it. So I thought that was quite in line with her character. Yeah. And then some of her classmates come in and she tries to talk to them and they're not really responding. And I'm not sure how I feel 
feel about that scene? Because I guess it's supposed to give us an indication of what high school has been like for Grace. Yeah. But it just feels like a very surface level. Like, okay, her classmates ignore her. But what is the deal here? <laughs> it falls a bit flat. Yeah, I don't think it was necessary. So yeah, the next scene is Grace's graduation. And this is where Meg appears. What would you think about her dramatic entrance? <laughs> I quite like Meg in this movie. Mm -hmm, me too. I felt for her, you know? <laughs> yeah, so for a bit of context, she accidentally slams into the graduation ceremony when someone is giving their speech and everyone turns to look at her and she can't escape because the door locks yeah. behind her. So she's forced <laughs> to walk to her seat in complete silence. And it's horrifying. And as funny as it was, I didn't quite understand that choice either because to me, it sets her up as someone who intentionally or not always steals the spotlight to herself mm -hmm. but this is not something that we see throughout the movie and I guess it's also supposed to establish the fact that Grace and Meg aren't that close to each other but it just felt like a weird choice to me I don't know if this applies specifically to her entrance but that whole scene at the graduation is supposed to paint Meg as more of a stuck up person kind of the way she dresses the way she criticizes Emma and everything mm -hmm. Except that we see all of these layers to Meg moving forward. And also, specifically that entrance, you see that it's also bad for her. Like, she's also really mortified. I like your take on it. But I think with the direction that they went in, they make her more sympathetic to us, which then going on makes it really difficult to take Grace or Emma's side <laughs> whenever they're fighting. Maybe it's also like, it's to show that lately nothing is going Meg's way. Her life has been on a downward spiral ever since she lost her mother and it's like she can't get out of this rut, you know? That could also be it. We see them having dinner and we see them romanticize France and Paris especially as this almost magical inn and it's really hard to watch. <laughs> they harp so much on this exoticism of a single city, I could barely stand it. I feel like they could have easily not done this by framing it as a more of a I won't see the world kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Especially because we established that these three characters have never really traveled much. And they do suggest that it's about self-discovery and searching for more in life than what they've got. Not, but it's all cheapened by the way they treat the idea of Paris. Like you said, we get one rebuttal to this attitude from Grace's mother. But that's kind of it. Yeah, and it's less about Paris and more about Grace herself. I would have liked to see that as in like using Paris as like a conduit or whatever. And I guess they do that here. But there is a way to do that without this like almost offensive attitude. Yeah, definitely. We get these two different scenes. One with Meg talking to her dad and another with... With Grace talking to her mom and I think this is where we get slightly two different perspectives on this trip because we learned that Paris is one of the places Meg's mom traveled and it was her favorite place that she went to so I think this is a valid enough reason for Paris to have a special significance yeah. for Meg. Whereas with Grace, she has set some pretty unrealistic expectations for this trip. Like you said, they could have used the trip to Paris as a tool to explore this theme and show Grace's journey as she realizes, but they don't explore it. The arc that Grace does get is not good. This should have been her arc. Coming into the realization that the fate of her life is in her hands, not based on the circumstances this around her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I also really think the parent-child relationship between Grace and her mother and Meg and her father are both pretty believable. That worry Robert has over his kid getting so lost in her grief that she's unable to move on with her life is really apparent. Not to mention a very real and grounded worry for your child that as a parent you can't do all that much about, especially when that kid is already an adult. So I really liked that aspect of the story. Yeah, it's too bad that it's a very small fraction of this whole story yeah. so anything positive we might have to say is just dwarfed by the glaring negatives yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's a pretty big oversight with Grace's arc that they completely choose to ignore this perfectly good storyline that she could have had yeah Another thing I do like that's portrayed here is the class divide between Meg and the other two. They don't get along for many reasons, not least of which is their differing interests and values, but the foundation for a lot of that is their socioeconomic background, it seems. Mm -hmm. 
You see with every jab thrown at each other that it's heavily fueled by certain prejudices about the group they each belong in. As this movie progresses, the thing I enjoy most is the dynamic between these three. It's helped immensely by their performance, but I think the foundation built here is really solid. I actually have a question. Mm -hmm. How do we feel about the parents upgrading their tickets out of nowhere? Do you think it almost demeans the effort Grace and Emma have put into raising all this money when suddenly Robert, the stepfather, and Emma's mom can suddenly shell for plane tickets? I don't know why it always ruffles my feathers a bit when that scene plays out. Like, it seems so easy for them to suddenly spring for Meg to also go on a trip to Paris and do all of that other shit. I hadn't thought about it, but now that you bring it up, perhaps it undermines their efforts a little. They've been saving up for years, and suddenly... <laughs> they already bought plane tickets, and they've made hotel reservations and everything. They spend money on that already. Then they come in with better plane tickets, and it's like all that money is lost that they could have used. Yeah. But later on, Emma is talking to her boyfriend Owen about the trip, and suddenly he gets incredibly insecure and acts like a simple trip with her friend is in any way a slight to their relationship. The whole thing with Owen is so dumb. It's entirely normal to want things outside of your relationship, and anyone who tries to tell you different does not have your best interest at heart. I definitely agree with you. It's perfectly valid and even healthy to have things going on outside of your relationship, but I do understand Owen's perspective a little because like you said they're established as characters who have had their experiences confined to this one place and so having his girlfriend venture out without him to this new adventure I can understand that he's feeling a little bit left out he is worried that he'll get left behind and his solution to this is to propose to Emma <laughs> and tell her not to go on the trip and it's like, even if he got engaged, she's still gonna go on the trip. It's like, it's not... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's law. Once you get engaged, <laughs> you have to stay next to your partner for the entirety of your life. <laughs> like, you can't even go to the bathroom by yourself. <laughs> I understand the fear in Owen. I still think he's a complete douche canoe. <laughs> But then I actually ended up liking him, but we'll get to that. He does have a positive arc, luckily, because he comes to his senses. Mm -hmm. So they go to Paris and they join the tour they've paid for, only to find out that it's probably the worst tour they could have possibly chosen. <laughs> Everything is rushed, they barely get to eat their promised meals, and their hotel is not as advertised. Yeah, there's this weird shot in the middle where the bus is going past the Arc de Triomphe. It's like this time lapse sort I don't know what it is, but it just felt like the movie was trying to do something all of a sudden, but it just stuck out to me <laughs> in an otherwise unremarkable cinematography it was so <laughs> jarring i was like what do you what why i was irrationally annoyed by it but i was annoyed <laughs> so just had to say that but one thing i did like and again, it hints to the potential that Grace's arc had is that they try to get immersed in the Parisian dream because when they arrive at Sacre Coeur and there's this beautiful view of Paris and La Vie en Rose starts playing at that exact moment, the tour guide blows her whistle and tells them, you know, get a move on. I thought that was going to be the point. Yeah, it was one of the moments in the movie where they acknowledged this theme. And they do it a couple more times, but they never commit. They never go into it in great depth, especially with the characters. It's almost like the theme is trying to burst out, but the characters don't acknowledge it. And they're on their complete different journey that doesn't make sense <laughs> in the context of this movie. This theme is crying out to be explored. Yeah, Grace especially. Because the other two actually, it's pretty in line with that theme. But Grace, even her arc with pretending to be Cordelia is also in line with this theme. But you see that arc take root in the story and unfold. And then suddenly she says another line about romanticizing Paris. And I'm like, you didn't learn! You didn't make the connection! <laughs> Grace, honey! <laughs> yeah. Now that you mention it, Emma and Meg do have their respective character development and realizations on the trip. But it's Grace that's still in denial. <laughs> Yeah, so they're at this terrible hotel that's nothing like it was advertised. And obviously they're not too thrilled about it. But Grace says to Meg, how can you complain? I get it's your thing, but come on, we're in Paris. And then she opens the curtains and we get this really weird shot of this guy in the bathtub wearing a beret. Cultural stereotypes aside, this is once again a moment where the romanticization of Paris 
versus the reality really comes to a head. But once again, it's not really addressed. Grace doesn't really come to her senses. Flies right over her head. She's not even phased by this view, <laughs> which I'm sure she was expecting to be a grand view of the Eiffel Tower, but that's not what they get. And also, I'm not really sympathetic with Grace at this point because she's demonizing Meg for complaining, but I would also be complaining because they're on this horrible trip. They don't get to eat any food. They end up at this horrible hotel. I think it's fair enough to complain. But it's like Grace is just too steeped into the fact that they're in Paris and it's a dream to even acknowledge that they've ended up in a less than ideal situation. Yeah, I think the whole Meg complaining thing is supposed to be about maybe Meg is more used to better accommodations. But the fact is, I don't think that's why Meg is complaining. It's because she was told it was going to be better than this. Exactly. Not only that, but I think that's what is in Grace's mind. She's influenced by this prejudice she has of Meg. Fair enough. An important thing that also happens here though is that Meg meets this guy Riley who's also traveling. They keep running into each other at these different locations and they flirt a little and it made me laugh because in real life I'd be a little freaked. Maybe that dude is a stalker or something but whatever. It only works in the flowery cinematic universe but in real life definitely it's a little creepy. Instead they subvert the expectation and they become the kidnappers <laughs> rather than getting kidnapped. This movie is a hit of its time. Breaking gender stereotypes. Hashtag <laughs> feminism. It sets our gender rights forward a hundred years. <laughs> So I do get why they're so upset. It was at least supposed to be a decent tour. And I can understand how that disappointment when faced with this disaster is heartbreaking. Things escalate further when at one stop, the buzz leaves them behind and they finally break away from the tour. The outrage laid out here is somewhat based on Grace's persisting romanticization of Paris, which is a ridiculous reason. But aside from that, I think the dawning disappointment and sadness is understandable. Also, like you said, this could have easily been the moment when they realized that their idea of Paris is wrong and unfair and the movie kind of starts unraveling this lofty idea. But they don't. Yeah, Grace has this, in my opinion, cringy line where she says, I'm sorry I ever thought I was the kind of person who could come to Paris. And I mean, I don't know what this means because it is true what you said that they're in different socioeconomic positions. But I don't know, I think Grace does have some degree of privilege. At the end of the movie, she's like volunteering in Romania. And that's not something you can just up and do, you know? I think what she says is less about her background or whatever. It's more about her unfairly thinking of Paris a certain way. Absolutely. I think we can see this in Emily in Paris as well. And the response that got from the majority of viewers, including French viewers, is that this is not the reality. Because like every other place in the world, France also has its good side and the bad side and there's pros and cons to living in Paris but the way Emily in Paris and Monte Carlo or well Grace <laughs> specifically <laughs> yeah. in Monte Carlo the way they portray Paris like it's some kind of you know flawless dream and that's not fair because you know <laughs> it's not real also it leads to like really harmful treatment of people and cultures mm -hmm. it completely ignores the nuance and makes them seem like they're fictional characters in some dream world. Yeah, and what she's saying is like in her version of Paris, it's a place where like shitty tours can't happen. So it's like she's <laughs> the reason this is that. Yeah, what you said, that's really interesting that nothing negative can possibly happen in Paris. To me, it was more like life in Paris is going to be glamorous and beautiful and much better than my life in Texas. And to me, money was tied quite closely to that because when they start having a better trip, it's when they're at a fancier hotel, when they're treated like royalty, when they get to go on these amazing adventures that you can't really do without money. So to me, that perspective was tied quite closely to having money, <laughs> or I guess rather not growing up with money. But it's just that whether it's recent or not, she does have it now. It's kind of undeniable. And this is apparent in the fact that they are given that upgrade by their parents, whether they want it or not, whether they're used to it or not, they've got it. And it just feels a little bit tone deaf that she's not aware of it. Because I mean, privilege is often a matter that we don't necessarily have a hand in. When it comes to generational wealth or when it comes to your race, the least you can do is be aware of it. <laughs> and it just seems like Grace isn't. So that stuck out to me and I didn't like it. 
yeah you make a good point so now they've been left behind by the tour and having to walk on foot in the rain <laughs> they end up taking shelter at a fancy hotel where they see Cordelia Winthrop Scott a guest who has an uncanny resemblance to Grace I have to say when they first come into the hotel Meg and Emma see the interior and Emma says something like Ooh, nice and big. And I'm just wondering, couldn't an establishing shot have shown us how grand the hotel is? I'm remembering those shots from Confessions of a Shopaholic where Rebecca is going around all of these malls and she's dwarfed by the giant decorations. And they could have shown us the glitz and glamour of the hotel that way, but they only focus on Emma and Meg and they choose to have Emma say it out loud instead of just showing us. Maybe they want to do this thing where it's like, we're gonna establish it by showing the reaction instead like a very character focused thing but like I don't think they're that intentional with the cinematography so far like the direction so that's a reach yeah that's why the Arc de Triomphe thing took me so (laughs) out of the movie because it just felt so uncharacteristic anyway that's digressing from the point which is Cordelia's introduction yeah The hotel mistakes Grace for Cordelia and they end up crashing in her room. The part that I do like in this sequence is how Meg and Emma are actually civil and somewhat bond when they both want to tease Grace. (laughs) Because they're telling Grace how much she looks like Cordelia and kind of ganging up on her on the subject. And it's just always nice to see like two wildly different characters find common ground through good-natured jibes to their loved one. (laughs) It was one of the very first times we see them kind of bicker without any real heat behind it. Yeah, that moment stood out to me too, especially when they first spot Cordelia and they share this look of complete disbelief. I thought that was a nice moment between the two. Yeah. When Grace gets mistaken for Cordelia, she decides to go along with it and her excuse is, it's been a really long day. (laughs) And it's like two things went wrong for you, one of which was the rain. And you can rejoin the tour again tomorrow morning. It's not such a big deal. And initially, I couldn't really understand why she was treating it like it's the end of the world. It's not like something horrible has happened. Like you've had your passport stolen or you were scammed out of all your money or you got into an accident. It's not like that. But yeah, I I suppose part of it is that her ideal vision of Paris is starting to come a little bit undone. So that might be the foundation for the degree of upset that she is. But because it's not undone, underscored by any character development or again they don't explore this theme to any depth that's why her being upset is almost just like a childish fit and I couldn't find myself being sympathetic with her at all I don't know I would be sad too I mean I wouldn't be like lashing out at people or anything but I'd be like disappointed yeah I mean that's totally valid The reason they stay at the hotel that they give, at least, I think is something like, oh, she's not using it anyway. The line that's where she's like, it's a long day. It's just in response. (laughs) That's not a... (laughs) This is where you start having real objections to the movie. (laughs) Well, yeah, this is where the crime starts, so... (laughs) But the next day, Cordelia is supposed to go to Monte Carlo and they get dragged on that trip because Cordelia is straight from her itinerary and these three are in her place instead. At this point, let's see what crimes they've committed now that we've brought up the subject. Identity theft, for sure. <laughs> and opening someone's mail because they open the package that tells them their destination. Probably credit card fraud since all of this is charged on Cordelia's card, I'm assuming. Possibly stealing a jet? <laughs> More to come. <laughs> Does eating her lobster count too? Because they steal her giant lobster dinner. (laughs) Maybe that's credit card fraud then. Okay. Yeah, plenty more to come. The thing that stuck out to me here is when they arrive in Monte Carlo and are surprised that Meg can speak French. (laughs) Like, even us, the audience, saw that she speaks French earlier in the movie. It just goes to show how little they know about each other. Mm -hmm. And another thing, of course, is the fact that Grace gives out Meg and Emma's real full names when introducing them to Theo and his father. They're, like, so bad at crime. I know you're upset about the crime. I'm upset at how inept they are at it. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that adds on to the anxiety because not Not only are they committing crimes, but they're also very bad at it. So the chances of them getting in trouble increase exponentially (laughs) when you're giving out your real names. Yeah, for sure. The only thing I had to say about this whole trip to Monte Carlo is, again, Grace's excuse for it is that it's seizing the moment and 
they convince Meg to go along with the excuse that when they're caught, Meg will get to say, I told you so. And that appears <laughs> to be convincing enough to bring her on the trip. And if anything captures how inane the story is, I think it's this moment. I think that was just them being mean to Meg or like, you know, harping on Meg's attitude or whatever. Like, I don't think that actually convinces her. But yeah, that night, they attend a ball held in Cordelia's honor that's supposed to kick off this charity effort, ending it with an auction at the end of the week. The three of them get dressed up, and I really do like that they each have a distinct style and that it goes with their characters. This remains consistent throughout the movie, during their more formal outfits and their everyday ensemble. I think the wardrobe is pretty well done. It's a part of the movie I can't help but notice. And actually, while we're on the subject, the thing I really want from this movie is... Meg's dress that she wears later on on top of the swimsuit. It's just like a wrap dress or a button-up dress or something, but like inside it's literally her swimsuit. So it's so practical for that kind of trip where you can just like take it off and it's like outerwear and then you put it on and it's like a dress with like a camisole underneath. I don't know, I just really love it. <laughs> and it really fits her character so well. That said, I really dislike Grace's get up for the ball. <laughs> the dress and necklace don't go together at all and it's like the whole look swallows her up. The silhouette it isn't all that suitable. I don't know how to put it exactly, but it gives the impression that the necklace and dress are too big on her. It's really a shame because this is supposed to be the big Cinderella moment almost. And the other two characters have dresses that are much more better suited to them. Maybe it's a way of showing that she's trying to fulfill Cordelia's shoes, but she's not really suited to it because it is established also that she is younger than the other two. She's still finding herself. She's still finding her identity. And this is almost like she's playing dress up because this ensemble <laughs> isn't really suited to her. You know, you put it really well. It's like she's playing dress up. I think I remember reading a review that said this, that it just feels like children playing dress up. And I think it applies especially to this scene and to Grace in particular. I do wish they had acknowledged the fact that she doesn't look quite right in the scene because everyone treats her like she's looking beautiful and they meet Cordelia's aunt who says that she looks really nice, but it might have been more interesting if they had acknowledged that, huh, you are you look interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is normally not quite the polished Cordelia that we see. It's really interesting too because the dress is fine, the necklace is fine, her hair is really done up and the hair especially, I really dislike on her and this outfit. Yeah, me too. It's like for someone much older or something, I don't know. Yeah, and she's got such a baby face as well that <laughs> it's very jarring. She just doesn't look mature enough for the look. It's, it's almost impressive. <laughs> <laughs> how they pulled this off. But we get the classic male gaze thing with the girls walking down the stairs in slow motion and Theo looking up at them. But I like that the first thing he says is, you're late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Instead of, you know, oh, you look beautiful or something. That's also how his dad greeted him when <laughs> these characters were first introduced. So maybe it's like a family love language. <laughs> I love that. That like, he's like that because he was taught that's what manners are. I actually love that detail. I didn't really, I didn't notice. Yeah, it stuck out to me. Like you said, at the ball, we meet Cordelia's Aunt Alicia, and they kind of pull off pretending that Grace is Cordelia. This is what convinces Meg, because Meg is so worried over getting found out. That's the thing too. I think at this point, like this especially cements it. I don't think her problem is like, it's a moral issue or it's wrong or whatever. It's like, she's scared that they're gonna get found out. <laughs> because the moment that she sees that even Aunt Alicia, who supposedly knows Cordelia well, buys that Grace is Cordelia, she's like, we're off to the races. <laughs> Yeah, true. Uh, I've been giving her too much credit. She's not <laughs> she's not as uh, as morally upstanding as I thought. Because she also steals that rose later on, actually. So it, <laughs> it runs in the family, even though they're not biologically related. And she's the one who initiates sneaking into the club. It's a family of criminals, honestly. <laughs> now that we're seeing Grace impersonate Cordelia more and more, it just, once again, it stuck out to me that Grace wanted this trip to transform her into a different person. And she literally gets a new identity to play with. And I think it would have been interesting to see her grapple with it. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, even the arc she gets is in line with this theme, but they don't follow through. I'm like, what's the point of giving her this Cordelia storyline if it wasn't supposed to fall in line with the theme? <laughs> <laughs> because throughout, she just takes these 
opportunities as they come. And to me, her motivation isn't quite clear. Even if it were an escape from her dull, drab life, even if that had been the reason that she decides okay, let me be Cordelia for a day. And then initially be really excited about this situation, but then start to get a reality check as the movie goes on. And she realizes that she's been looking down on her life and she's been glamorizing this other type of fantasy life that turns out to have its own pitfalls. I think that would have been more interesting than whatever it is that we do get because I don't understand Grace's motivation at all. I think it is the underlying motivation and the whole romanticization of Paris thing. That's also what that's about, thinking the grass is greener, blah blah blah, right? Yeah, and she's literally taken to the highest of highs, to the top 1% of society where this fantasy life that she dreams of, it's like at its height with the fancy rich people. <laughs> they literally just didn't complete that arc for Grace. They just got distracted by the first of many generic white boys. Not even the first. <laughs> he, he's like the third that shows up. Actually, he's the last one. <laughs> yeah. So the next day, they're relaxing on the beach when Meg and Emma get into a fight. I think this fight especially shows that their issues with one another is very much superficial and based on surface level things. Because once one of them says something that's more serious, they backpedal real quick. Meg does look down on Emma and says mean things about her sometimes. But I think in this instance, I think it was an offhanded comment on Meg's part because Emma says something about how it's a science. You know, when you're sun tanning, you have to turn every three minutes. And Meg says, biology is a science. And I generally think it's just an <laughs> offhanded, sarcastic comment. And I think that's just in line with the kind of sense of humor she has. But I felt like the other two take it upon themselves to almost take what she says as an insult or as complaining, even when it's not. And I guess it shows a fundamental lack of understanding between them, where even when it's not necessarily aimed as an insult or as anything in particular, they take it as such and use it to start a conflict. Well, I think that's a valid point. I don't think it's that unfair that they take it personally or that Emma takes it personally because compounded with everything else, like all of their past, it's more of an insult on Emma's intelligence or whatever. I think Meg's well aware that this is definitely like not an innocent comment. Yeah, I suppose compounded with everything else <laughs> that she has said <laughs> uh, and her attitude towards Emma, I can see how whether it was meant that way or not, she might take it as another instance where she's implying that Emma isn't good enough compared to Meg. After the fight, they split up to spend the day separately, and Meg actually runs into Riley and spend the day with him. These two end up bonding over their past trauma, Meg's being the death of her mother. It kept hitting me while I watched this movie that I really enjoy this actress's performance. Like I said, she imbues this character with a certain quality that makes her really grounded, and she plays that heartbreak and sense of being lost in her life quite well. This character can so easily be grating because of how uptight she tends to be, or you you know, her less than kind perception of someone like Emma. But there's an earnestness in the way it's all portrayed that softens those edges for me. Yeah, I agree with you. It would be really easy to have Meg be quite unsympathetic, especially because she's the type of character people don't necessarily like because she's more reserved and she's portrayed as more uptight. She's not quote-unquote fun compared to someone like Emma who's more outgoing and more spontaneous. So Meg could come off as quite boring, but Leighton Meester definitely brings a lot of charm and a lot of depth to the character that makes it a lot easier to root for Meg. And I guess I'm also <laughs> just also like less impartial because I relate to her more. <laughs> that scene after they're swimming and they're having that picnic or whatever, it's nothing special, you know, it's nothing groundbreaking. Like the writing isn't especially good or whatever. But the way she plays it, Lance, you can see on her face that it, it really was like a really traumatic time in her life, you know? Yeah, I almost appreciate that they didn't try to do anything too much with the dialogue because they gave the actors the space to just portray it with without the extra words. If the actor had done less 
of a good job, the scene would have totally tanked. Another notable scene in this montage where Meg and Riley get to know each other is that Riley juggles potatoes. <laughs> and I thought that was worth a mention because obviously, if you're going to look for any quality in a partner, it's the ability to juggle potatoes. I think that's where Meg fell in love with him a little bit. You could see it in her eyes. For real though. <laughs> Meanwhile... Grace ends up having to play polo as Cordelia and gets found out by Aunt Alicia that she's an imposter. And Grace convinces her to keep it a secret so that the charity auction can go on as planned. It's less believable to me that Aunt Alicia would care enough about the charity and the kids. She'd be more worried about this outsider impersonating one of them. This is the flowery cinematic universe where, <laughs> you know, everything just works out and everyone has, well, not everyone, not Grace, but <laughs> people have a conscience and it's not the most un realistic part of the movie to me that that she might care about the charity cause i guess what i found really funny is when aunt alicia calls cordelia cordelia doesn't know who it is <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't have her aunt's number saved oh yeah what strikes me every time grace is pretending to be cordelia is that she's so bad at it she constantly seems to forget that she's supposed to be putting up a persona she slips in and out of her accent she tells stuff to people about her own upbringing and her own life that don't necessarily line up with how things might have been for cordelia and the only reasoning I can come up with for no one realizing that it's actually Grace is that no one really pays that much attention to Cordelia even though they're constantly chasing her whether it's to serve her or whether it's for their own purposes there was potential for there to be a lot more depth to Cordelia's character but once again the movie is so focused on other things namely Grace's romance and having her end up with a boy that they don't really pay attention to it it's a shame in my opinion yeah for sure at the end of the day Grace and Theo the guy whose charity Cordelia is helping bond and watch the fireworks together you know we've talked about this but I think Grace's is the least well done storyline which is weird because she's the main character but I'm really not invested in her arc she's got no arc her arc is a straight line <laughs> like a flat line <laughs> My big problem with her is actually that she's not flawed in the same way as Meg and Emma. Like, obviously she's flawed because she's <laughs> committing all these crimes and stuff. But actually, like, the movie doesn't portray that as a flaw. It's just, like, a thing that's happening in the movie, right? But Meg and Emma are flawed and they overcome that flaw or, like, they contend with it or something. But Grace isn't. Grace is, like, the nice one. And she's, like, the relatable, ordinary one. And she's generous and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know, it makes her really, like, luster, especially when you've got Meg and Emma and they're maybe not, like, the most well-written character, but they've got so much more depth than Grace. Yeah, it's bad enough that she's almost like this Mary Sue character, but it's made worse by the fact that she's also in complete denial. Her delusion, it's almost framed as a positive aspect of her character because we get this really romantic scene between her and Theo where they're watching the fireworks, they're looking out at the city and she's talking about this snow globe she used to have as a child of the Eiffel Tower and how it was magical. Just just like this and this reminded me of the criticism for Confessions of a Shopaholic. People accused Confessions of a Shopaholic of glamorizing consumerism because we saw this rosy world that Rebecca lives in. But the movie doesn't reward her for it. She faces the consequences of what she's done. Whereas here, the romanticization of Paris and the glorification of a certain life, her deluded attitude doesn't really create any negative consequences for her she gets away with it and not only does she get away with it she's rewarded for it like i said i wish her arc is more about a reality check and how meaning lies in what she chooses to do instead of surrounding circumstances but like that's kind of what they're circling around what with theo and cordelia's lives being empty despite their resources but we go through this whole thing with theo like going on and on about does it really have any meaning for me like it doesn't feel like i'm actually doing anything and i thought like grace gets it i thought at this point she's now realized the reality of things right but then suddenly she says the thing about paris and the love young rose thing and i'm like like, wait a second, I thought we just learned. Grace's perspective on that whole thing is just being bummed that she doesn't actually have this life. 
later on in the night, she talks with Emma. And her issue isn't, I was wrong. There isn't meaning here after all. This didn't fix me or whatever. Her problem is that like, I found someone who likes me for me and I'm not even me. If only this was actually my life, then I could be with Thea. Like her problem is that she doesn't have these circumstances. And I'm like, Grace, you missed the whole fucking point. I'm so mad. <laughs> It would have been funny if we had a story where the story is like try to teach the character a lesson and it gets increasingly obvious and in your face, but the character keeps missing the point. That's the level of frustration I feel with Grace. Yeah. So Emma, on the other hand, is invited to dinner with Domenico, a man she met at the ball. And she joins him on a fancy boat. I quite liked Emma's storyline as well here. How she gets to see how the other half lives and finds out that it's actually not what she thought it'd be. The worst part, of course, is that these rich guys treat the staff assisting them poorly. And she sees that if she were all dolled up and everything, these guys would treat her the same. Hell, they're already not showing her all that much respect. She's only there as arm candy, not one person even making the effort to talk to her in a language she understands. You know, that whole not all that glitters is gold sentiment that she discovers here is really nice. I just wish the others, Grace especially, <laughs> come to that realization about Paris. I really liked this scene of Emma's, especially because she dreams of bigger things for herself. But I also like that she's got self-respect and doesn't pity herself for her situation the way Grace does. I really liked that she passed her plate to the waitress and then to make her point even stronger, she stood up and took over herself. And when we saw her watching the fireworks by herself all alone, the expression on her face was quite content and you could feel that her arc was coming to a satisfying conclusion because she realizes that she doesn't need all these fancy things in life to be happy. It was such a satisfying moment and one that I wish we had for Grace as well. Yeah, but we do get one scene where Meg and Emma run into each other and they kind of apologize to each other and this happens kind of towards the end of their arc. So they've, you know, learned things about themselves that make them see the other a little differently. But the important thing here is that Emma's wearing the famed necklace and Meg takes it from her for safekeeping and puts it in Riley's bag. Not only is it super expensive, but it's also going to be auctioned off on Friday. So it's definitely <laughs> very important. Yeah. I liked that Meg and Emma make up. I just wish that... There was more of it. Yeah, because all they really say is I'm sorry. And it's like putting on a band-aid, but not really putting on the medicine <laughs> that's going to heal the wound. This scene stands out to me, especially in the context of the next one, where Grace and Emma are back at the hotel and they have this talk. Emma starts off by voicing her issues and you know she's worried about how she might have messed things up with Owen because she's come to the realization that all she really needs to be happy in life is to be with Owen but Grace doesn't really respond yeah. <laughs> she just starts talking about her own problems and I understand that this is more of a big sister, younger sister relationship than it is a mutual friendship. Emma has to be the one to comfort Grace, even when she's dealing with her own issues. And that's understandable. But this is where Meg and Emma have a more equal standing because they're the same age, they were classmates. And if they mend their relationship in a meaningful way, Meg could have been the one to comfort Emma and have a more meaningful exchange with her rather than just a surface level apology the next morning a million things happen at once <laughs> yeah the necklace is gone because riley has now left for the train station and the necklace is still in his bag because meg forgot cordelia arrives expecting to stay in her suite and something we haven't really discussed but owen has traveled all the way to monte carlo in the hopes of finding emma and talking to her this is the climax of the movie and i read a review that said the movie had a sort of pink panther-esque humor and hijinks and i can definitely see that here in the music especially <laughs> yeah the part that bothered me most is that that they finally managed to escape the hotel unscathed, but they decide to go back when they miss the train Riley's supposed to be on. It's ridiculous to me that they would go back to fix this. It's so naive and short-sighted to think they can make 
anything better. To me, this seems quite in line with Grace's deluded perspective. And maybe it's because of her age, she's more immature and maybe more short-sighted than the others. But the others go along with it as well and it's supposed to be a positive thing at least on Meg's part because she's more spontaneous now and less uptight but I think it would have made for a much more satisfying conclusion or at least a more realistic one as realistic as we can get if they had just abandoned the mission and left because at least then it makes sense why they don't have to face any serious consequences for what they've done even though Grace has given out her friends' real names. <laughs> <laughs> so they probably would have tracked them down. Can you imagine like that last shot of them on the train just like looking at each other like, oh my god, we did something so bad. You know what I mean? This is a secret we'll take <laughs> yeah. to our graves or something, you know? Like, And the three of them have that to bond over for the rest of their lives. And it still would have been a satisfying enough conclusion with the three of them having come to their respective conclusions and they would have gone back different people and it would have made sense why they got away with it. But no, they go back to the hotel to talk to Cordelia thinking, hey, maybe she'll understand, but Cordelia does not understand. <laughs> also, they find Riley. He's actually there. He didn't leave because he found the necklace and so they get the necklace back. One thing I have to say is I really like Cordelia's entrance into the hotel because they shot it slightly at a lower angle and it makes her look like such a looming presence. And once again, I think this is the movie trying to frame her as a villain, which I don't think they totally succeeded but that was fun I liked that part one of the like two things I like about this movie <laughs> she is a fun tool in this movie actually like whenever she shows up it kicks things up into high gear but also like instead of simply returning the necklace and running as they should be doing they're confronting Cordelia in person it's so fucking dumb anyway a bunch of things happen the cops are there they've tied Cordelia because she wants to cancel the auction yada yada who fucking cares wait you're just glossing over <laughs> the abduction I don't have anything to say about it. I couldn't get over the abduction <laughs> because it's like the cherry on top of the crime cake. We were keeping track of criminal activity, right? And this is number five, maybe? I have no idea. <laughs> and a pretty serious one at that because they tie her up and shove an apple in her mouth. And it's just, <laughs> how am I supposed to root for these characters after this? Like, they're just taking it to the point of no return. And they steal the necklace. That's also crime number six because they tie her up and they take the necklace to the auction. And it's supposed to be for a good cause, but it doesn't change the fact that they steal it. It got to a point where like they shove the apple in her mouth and I'm like, are they going to kill her? Is she a pig for slaughter? Is that what the apple is about? <laughs> oh my God. They're going to kill her and then Grace is going to take her place forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was really funny too how nonchalant Emma was actually. Like she was flipping through a magazine. Right? Seasoned criminal. It would have been interesting though if that is the direction they had gone in where Grace just replaces Cordelia. <laughs> The movie doesn't like reveal it. You think they're like, okay, we're gonna go home. And then like Meg goes on her way and Emma goes on her way. And we see like as if Grace is also going on her way, but we don't really see it. And then we follow Cordelia for a time. And then at the end, she like winks at the camera or something. <laughs> or we see her wearing those cowboy boots instead of heels. Oh yeah. That ending would have fit the genre a lot more than the ending we do get. Because this is more like a crime movie, like a crime thriller. It's not that serious. It's girls being girls. <laughs> It's a fun girl's night. You're right. This is what girls actually do on sleepovers. <laughs> they steal people's identities. They hijack jets. They steal millions of dollars in the form of sparkly jewelry. They read other people's mail. <laughs> Tie someone up and gag them. That's a fun girl's night out. When Emma is looking after the hog-tied Cordelia, <laughs> Owen shows up at the door and they make up. To me, that's kind of the only thing of note. Owen apologizing to Emma and saying that he doesn't want to ever keep her from something better. And that's not what being in a relationship with him is ever gonna be. And I really like that. Regardless of how crappy Owen started out being, I do like a clear-cut proclamation that loving someone doesn't mean they're supposed to be the best thing in your life. And the only thing I don't like is that we had a whole thing with Emma where she's like, maybe Owen was right or like, maybe I shouldn't have let him go or something. Because even if this glamorous life isn't what she thought it'd be and these people are assholes, it doesn't mean you should stay with your controlling boyfriend. It just means like that it doesn't have meaning either. But I do like that at least Emma gets together with him once he apologizes for the exact reason that they broke up in the first place. Yeah, I do agree with you. I didn't like 
the fact that because Emma realized that this glamorous life wasn't necessarily what she wanted in life, she immediately reverted to Owen. And this is before she knew that Owen wanted to apologize to her and had realized his mistake. But anyway, it turns out well and Owen does realize what he's done wrong. And the fact that a minor side character has more meaningful development than our main character says so much. And this is a huge reason why I don't like this movie. Because the character we're meant to be rooting for, the character who's meant to be leading the story, is insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> so Grace goes to the charity event and auctions off the necklace. And mid bidding war somehow feels all guilty and confesses. I hate this so much. There is no reason for Grace to reveal her deception. It's also like she doesn't understand real consequences, aka criminal charges. The only thing she cares about is Theo too, like in that moment. All she cares about is like, Theo is gonna think I'm fake, blah 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 blah. And it's like, who cares? Grace, you are gonna spend 25 to life in prison. <laughs> it just goes to show that the delusion continues and nothing is enough to break it. While Emma has been making up with Owen, Cordelia escapes the hotel room and barges into the auction. And it just gets more and more absurd. She urges the police to arrest them, but they just don't. I think another reason I'm also angry at this movie is that it put me through so much anxiety over everything the characters were doing the whole time that they're gonna face serious consequences over this, but they just magically don't. Yeah, bad ending. Even with how long it is, we still get an epilogue. <laughs> Meg actually leaves to travel with Riley. Owen and Emma, I guess, move in together back home. And Grace volunteers for the charity Theo's family was raising money for in Romania. Turns out Theo is also at that charity at the same time as Grace and he happens to spot her as she's cycling away. They have a reunion and have a fresh start and that's how the movie ends. And the impression it leaves me with is that the whole point of the story was for Grace to find a boyfriend. Mission accomplished, they lived happily ever after and it completely negates anything of value that this movie could have explored. It already ignores this very interesting theme from the very beginning. Not only is it disappointing that it doesn't follow through on it, but it also gives us this as an ending. Yeah. So, in absurd conclusion, the answer to happiness is generic white guy. Each of them have yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> That's their souvenir. So I guess your opinions have changed. Yeah, they have done an absolute 180 and they would do more if that didn't mean coming back around in a circle. <laughs> I cannot fathom why I enjoyed this movie as a kid. I am frankly infuriated at myself for liking this movie at any point in time. I actually did do a 360 on this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. I hate Grace's storyline and so much of this movie and it's too long. And through all that suffering, I came out the other side. Even you had a character arc before Grace <laughs> yeah. did. I had fun. I still think it's a fun rock. Part of it, I think, is also to do with expectations. I knew going into this movie what it was going to be. I'm even going to say I recommend this movie. I don't think it's like unwatchable is the thing. The way Letters to Juliet was for me. Actually, Grace's scenes or like particular lines of hers was really hard to watch. But the rest of it was fine. I could get through it. Whereas in Letters to Juliet, every scene I was tearing my hair out. I was like, what are you saying? <laughs> Sorry, not to <laughs> rag on Letters to Juliet. <laughs> That's all roads lead back to ragging on Letters to Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you wouldn't recommend this movie I take it. <laughs> no. My reasons are twofold. <laughs> <laughs> they had so much potential staring them in the face, but they didn't use it. It promises to be such a fun movie, and there was also that potential of making it into something meaningful, and they just didn't deliver. So that's the first reason. But the second reason to me is more important because above everything, I'll just look at the storytelling and whether that's compelling. And it's just a bad story. It's like writing a story and ending it 
but it was all a dream because nothing the characters do matters because at the end they get away with it for no reason like I can't even credit the characters for getting away with it because they had nothing to do with it it just magically happens I will give them some credit in that Emma and Meg were bearable and I did like their story arcs. That was compelling enough to me, but Grace's was just such a glaringly unbearable storyline that I don't want anyone else to suffer through it. <laughs> The only thing this movie successfully did for me is make me want to visit Monte Carlo because it looks very pretty. I want to go to Monte Carlo and juggle potatoes. Yeah, I want to go to Monte Carlo and keeping in theme, steal one of those race cars. Go for a joyride. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be fine because the police don't arrest you there. I'll just say I'm very sorry. It was all for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you say it's for the kids, they'll let you get away with it. Next time, we'll be discussing Barbie as the princess and the pauper. If you have any thoughts to share on the movie, send them in at graveyard underscore slot on Twitter and Instagram, or email us at thegraveyardslot at gmail.com so we can share on the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Graveyard Slot.